Hi everybody, it's Adam with ArcValveSurgery.com and today we're answering your questions about the need for mitral valve surgery. I am thrilled to be joined by Dr. Mark Gerdish, who's the Chief of Cardiac Surgery at Franciscan Health in Indianapolis, Indiana. During his extraordinary career, Dr. Gerdish has performed over 6,000 cardiac procedures, of which more than 4,000 involved some form of heart valve repair or heart valve replacement. Dr. Gerdish, let's get started with this question from Wolfgang who asks, Adam, I'm 25. I've got mitral regurgitation between zero to one on a scale of four, but I'm afraid that it can progress. Do most people with mitral regurgitation and mitral valve prolapse eventually need a repair or a replacement? Well, I'm really glad Wolfgang asked that question because I think it's one that should be answered to a wide audience. And one, it's one of the reasons that I love your site because people can get, a lot of people can get this information now. So mitral valve prolapse is common. Um, when we talk about mitral valve prolapse, we just mean that some portion of the valve comes up above the level of what we call the annulus. So it comes up out of the plane of where the leaflets attach. People who have a leak with mitral valve prolapse, of course, are concerned about that leak getting worse. So 2% of the people in the world have got mitral valve prolapse. That's a lot of people, right? Only a small subset of them will progress to needing something done. So let's talk about Wolfgang. So Wolfgang has a small leak, zero to one. And if we look at the literature, the worst case scenario for zero to one in five years is 5%. That's worst case scenario of those patients will progress to severe mitral insufficiency. On the other hand, if you have mitral valve prolapse and you have moderate insufficiency, 50% of those people will progress in five years to severe insufficiency. And the only real predictor we have of, of who those patients are is the size of their annulus. So if we look at folks who have moderate insufficiency, if their annulus, which is where the leaflets attach, is kind of the, or the size of the hole or the orifice, if it's four centimeters or more, they have a considerably higher incidence of progression. Whereas folks who have smaller annuli, which kind of makes sense, of course, because the leaflets are closer together, are less likely to progress. Now that's gonna vary with the size of the patient, the size of their heart, whether they have other conditions, atrial fibrillation, et cetera. But th those are the basic guidelines. So the answer Wolfgang specifically, very unlikely Wolfgang, that you're gonna end up needing an operation. So he's still the Wolfgang's gonna say, well, you know what, I'm very in tune to my body. I wanna be sure that I'm okay. How often should you th this be checked? Because Dr. Gertis just said five years. He didn't say 10 or 15 years. So my answer to Wolfgang would be number one, he should address his own level of anxiety. So that's important, right? Somebody wants to know if they feel like they hear a click or they're getting palpitations or something, they should always get that checked out. They should see their physician who knows how to evaluate their heart, I think once a year. That only makes sense. You've got some condition that should be checked. That person, that physician will probably make the decision on how often to look. In Wolfgang's situation, because if I had my first echo and I first saw that, I would want another echo in two years. If it looked exactly the same, I'd push out to three years. If it looked exactly the same, I'd probably be on a three to five year schedule. I hope that makes sense, but these are serious issues for people, right? So you initially a little bit tighter window, and then if it's completely stable and your heart's normal, you can spread it out. If you have moderate insufficiency, so three plus, not one plus or one and a half or two, if you have moderate leak in the valve, two or three plus, those patients then need to be followed more closely. And that's annually, I think, for those people to get a look at the valve and make sure that it's stable. Wolfgang, I hope that helped you. I know it helped me. And Dr. Gerdish, I've got to ask you, patients, we can be really confused. Uh, we see echocardiograms we don't truly understand. We see uh, results on diagnostic texts we don't really understand. Um, real quick, can you talk maybe a little bit about the scale that Wolfgang was referring to the zero, the ones, the twos, the threes, and how that relates to the severity of mitral regurgitation? So that's a great question. And you're right, people see their reports now, right? People have access to their charts and they read the reports. 
So I'm going to I'm going to take this in two directions. One is that a leak of a mitral valve uh, of trace or one plus is considered normal. Two plus is a little bit more than normal, but it doesn't have any hemodynamic consequence. And again, in two plus, if we follow those patients over time, there's a low incidence of them progressing. When we get into three plus, that is a solid moderate leak and that needs to be followed closely. And four plus is severe and not only does it need to be followed closely, but most of the time it needs to be fixed, even before there are any ill consequences to the patient, as long as they're able to get to somebody who can, with great certainty, repair that valve. So that's the scale. Zero to one, that's normal. One to two, including two, really mild and not something to be concerned about, but is worthy of some attention. Three, a lot of attention. Four, usually needs to be fixed, mitral regurgitation. You mentioned something that's kind of near and dear to my heart though. People see the reports, right? So one of the things that is a little bit of a thorn in my side with respect to the way we manage health is that we have these fabulous studies that give us all this data, left atrial dimensions, pulmonary uh, artery pressures, tricuspid insufficiency, mitral insufficiency, ventricular chamber dimensions, strain, circumferential longitudinal strain, these kind of subtle ways of looking at heart muscle performance. And unfortunately, often people just get the echo and they say, well, yeah, your mitral regurgitation looks about the same. It's important that if the patient sees a number that's out of bounds or that has changed, it's important they have an answer. Why is it different? Why is my left atrium larger now? Why does this suggest that my pulmonary artery pressures are higher? I know my mitral valve looks the same, but is it worrisome that I have more leak in my tricuspid valve? Now, a lot of the times it's not gonna be anything. It'll be a variation in their volume status or whatever, but often it is the, a little step toward pathology. So I think people have to be, they have to be their own advocates um, because you know doctors are looking at a lot of things, a lot of reports, and sometimes they don't have time to really ferret through those details. So you shouldn't be afraid to ask those questions. Dr. Gerdish, I love the fact that you brought up the use of the word advocacy for patients because we need to know our bodies, we need to know our hearts, and we need to know the changes that can happen with a disease as insidious as heart valve disease over time. So on behalf of all the patients in our community, thank you so much for these wonderful words of advice and insights about the need for mitral valve surgery. Thank you, Adam, and keep up the great work. We appreciate it. Hi, everybody. It's Adam. I hope you enjoyed that video. And don't forget, you can always subscribe to our YouTube channel. Watch the next two educational videos coming up on your screen or click the blue button to visit heartvalvesurgery.com.